We're here with David, David Lewis from Kroll. Maybe start with an introduction. Thank you. Yes. So um, I started at Kroll in January. Uh, I'm leading Kroll's anti-money laundering advisory service. And that means I'm working with governments around the world to strengthen their uh, efforts to stop money laundering. So with law enforcement agencies, with financial intelligence units, and with supervisory authorities, particularly in those jurisdictions that are, are suffering in emerging and, and developing markets. Uh, and I joined Kroll from the Financial Action Task Force, uh, where I was the uh, executive secretary for the last for the last six years. So I've been leading global efforts to tackle money laundering and terrorist financing uh, for 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 nearly a decade now. Mm. Big challenge. Any markets that are at higher risk, if you will? So this is really interesting. When you look at um, compliance with global standards, the markets you would think are at risk uh, are often the smaller ones that end up on lists, whether they're the EU list or a financial action task force list. But actually, the markets that are at greatest risk are those where the dirty money ends up. Mm -hmm. And the situation in Ukraine right now shows that that is London. Um, it's New York. Um, and so the biggest risk uh, areas are actually the global global financial centers. Yeah, yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on our current situation, so the war in uh, Ukraine and with Russia? So, the, I mean, the war in, in, in Ukraine, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has created a really a unique set of risks. It's heightened money laundering and terrorist financing risk. Uh, it's destabilized the whole region that creates all kinds of new risks, of course. Um, but also it's led to unprecedented sanctions from around the world on Russia. Um, and implementing these sanctions is a real challenge. You know, finding the assets of Putin and people supporting Putin is not always easy. They rarely have um, yachts and so on in their own names. Uh, they use shell companies uh, and something that Kroll does and is very good at doing is tracking down these assets, finding out where they are, which jurisdictions they're in, whether shell companies are being used to hide the ultimate ownership of, of these assets so that they can be seized. Um, so that this can really have an, a major impact because of course we don't want to, we don't want the war to extend. Uh, of course we don't want it in Ukraine at all but we certainly don't want it to extend beyond Ukraine. So it's critical that we make these sanctions work. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us a couple of methods that you would use, for example, in this case? Yes. Yeah, so when we're looking at um, um, uh, stolen assets, for example, or, or, um, or the proceeds of crime, um, we will um, start with what we know from open source information, but we'll also use human intelligence networks on the ground and we'll use um, data and technology to provide unique insights into where assets may be, what we can find out about the people, their associates, their social networks, uh, do that kind of network analysis around it. And that will give us a good idea of where to look, uh, where the assets are, where the big prizes are, and whether they can be seized, um, and ultimately whether they can be recovered. Because it's one thing freezing assets due to sanctions, and it's another thing being able to um, recover any value and sell off those assets. And unless you can prove a link to a crime, then that's very difficult indeed. In fact, all, all we may end up doing is looking after these assets for a while for these oligarchs before having to give them back when sanctions are finally lifted. lifted. And of course, that's not what we want. Mm. So how are we doing on a global scale in terms of proof? Well, I mean, it, when, you, when you talk about money laundering generally, we're doing very badly. Mm. Um, uh, there is a, a system that's created a set of rules, laws, regulations, institutions that are there to tackle it, but there hasn't been the political will, the investigation, the enforcement culture to go after dirty money. Mm -hmm. And so it really takes events like, unfortunately, we're seeing in Ukraine today to provide that political will to go after dirty money. Uh, and, uh, you know, sadly, that tends to be the pattern. It tends to take some investigative journalism, the Panama Papers, the war, before we see real action against dirty money. Yeah, yeah. 
some uh, big alarm bells, if you will, big cases uh, to shake the round. Yeah, it's no longer acceptable not to do anything about it. Uh, we can't sit back and, and be happy that this money is is undermining democracies everywhere. It's um, you know fueling more crime and terrorism. Mm. Um, so we have to act, and um, and, and countries are acting now, uh, better late than never. Um, but hopefully, it's a game changer. So how do we move from uh, being more reactive towards proactive on a global scale? Sure. Well, we need to build the capacity to do that. And that's about investing in investigations and in intelligence work. It's about having the ability to do financial investigations. A lot of uh, countries just haven't invested in that. They may have passed laws and regulations. They may have criminalized money laundering. Um, but they're not actually going after it because they haven't prioritized this as a crime nationally. And so their police are just not going after it. Uh, and things like beneficial ownership registries, yeah. where we find out who's ultimately behind you know companies and and, and, and trust legal arrangements is really really important mm -hmm. and making sure that information is available and not just to law enforcement mm -hmm. but also to to journalists investigative journalists um, because they are playing an increasingly critical role in the fight against financial crime so transparency getting information out there about who ultimately owns and controls assets um, an open government is really really important mm. transparency has not always been easy. In mm. fact, when things went terribly wrong, financial institutions did not want to share that externally, no. of course. Uh, are we getting into more into a culture of sharing that knowledge? We certainly are. And I think um, it's taken probably the big bank fines in the last decade led by the US to change the culture within banks. When I was in law enforcement, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you needed a production order to get the bank to share information. These days, we're seeing public-private partnerships in countries around the world where you have law enforcement officials in the same room as compliance officers from banks and sharing information in real time. And so they realize that they need to do this and be good corporate citizens. Citizens. And that's a really good opportunity. Mm -hmm. Apart from uh, corporate uh, citizenship, uh, a lot of people think when they read these sorts of cases in a public debate, oh, whatever, it's not in my backyard. How can we change that perception and make it more relevant to the individuals, if you will? Yeah, so they have to realize that um, although um, the terrorism may be taking place somewhere else or the war somewhere else, that th their financial system or their lawyers and accountants may be, their professional laborers may be facilitating it. Mm -hmm. And their money may be flowing through their jurisdiction or companies may be created in their jurisdiction, um, but not actually exist there. You know, the, this massive market in shell companies where you have, you know, a house with a sign on the door, no one inside, but thousands of companies based there allegedly. So they need Need to understand the part they're playing wittingly or unwittingly in the global problem um, and I think they're beginning to get it and, you know and, and big investigative journalist pieces and, and leaks like the FinCEN leaks get to shine a light on this kind of activity and make people understand it. Mm -hmm. There's another thought I'd like to test with you, if you will, if that's possible. So there is a uh, philosopher, a Dutch one, and uh, Gabriel van der Brink. He mm -hmm. talks about we're living in the spirit with a, um, if you will, a normative increase. So people are more aware about integrity, what is right, what mm -hmm. is wrong, do, doing the right thing, making the right choices, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. We also see that in the financial domain and also in this space. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that maybe the era that we're in is also giving a push in your space, if you will, to take the next step in the coming years? I think it is. It hasn't happened as quickly as I think it, 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 it might have done. Um, you know, for example, if you are a bank customer and you see your bank fined for being complicit with money laundering activity in Mexico, whatever it is, and the harm that that generates, maybe you don't want a bank there anymore. Maybe you want to move to another bank. And so I think um, corporate corporations are becoming more aware of this mm -hmm. um, and the need to, um, uh, to do the right thing and that's good. That, that's good business practice. It's good. It, it creates shareholder value, um, and that's starting to happen. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have ESG, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and that's starting to drive an agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we're, gener- we're connecting the dots now in a way that we've never done before. You look at the pandemic, you can draw the links between the pandemic and, Ill- and illegal wildlife trafficking, for example. And the same organized crime networks that are behind illegal wildlife trafficking are also behind arms trafficking and drugs trafficking. And so people can start to see how this is all these harms are interconnected um, and there are professional enablers there are financial institutions lawyers accountants who are enabling all of this to happen um, and that's why the drive has to come from consumers from the public say well we, we won't accept this we will not use you uh, we don't want to be in a jurisdiction that, that that does this so david what is your drive My drive is to reduce the harm from from money laundering because it fuels crime and terrorism. So anything I can do to get people to understand that it's not a victimless crime, uh, money laundering is not a victimless crime, that it does fuel fuel crime and terrorism, and that there are easy things that we can do to stop it, to generate the political will, um, that's, that's my main mission. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.